Welcome to the NEB TV webinar series. Today, I am pleased to introduce Ezra Schilkraut, who is an application and product development scientist here at NEB. Hi, Ezra. Hi, Dina. And what are we talking about today? Uh, today, we're going to talk about the tools that NEB has available for genome editing that will help simplify genome editing workflows. Great. Let's get started. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our Gene Editing 101 webinar. Today, we're going to go over some of the methods and tools that NEB has available for simplifying your genome editing workflows. So today, we'll start off going over some of the background biology of the CRISPR-Cas system, and then move on to discuss the workflows for genome editing experiments and how we have worked to simplify these workflows. We will first go over how to design your target sequences, and then we'll discuss the different methods of nuclease generation and usage. After that, we'll focus on how to generate your guide RNAs. Uh, the next step will be the methods on how to deliver the Cas9 and RNA complexes to the cells. Finally, we will discuss the detection and analysis of the editing events that you have induced. After the webinar is concluded, we will have some time to take some of your questions. Any that we can't get to, we will do our best to follow up via email as soon as we can. So first, I'm going to do a very brief overview of the Cas9 biology before we get started. The CRISPR-Cas9 system is a natural bacterial immune system. Bacteria have evolved this system to capture pieces of incoming foreign DNA to be used to target future invasions. The biotechnology field has been able to take advantage of this natural bacterial immune system referred to as CRISPR, which stands for Cluster Regularly Interspaced Short Palindrome Repeats. Cas9 stands for CRISPR-associated protein 9, and its role is as an RNA-guided DNA endonuclease. It uses those snippets of foreign sequence to target and destroy new invaders. For us, this equates to essentially a highly specific programmable restriction enzyme. This is extremely useful for biotechnology as it increases potential target sites in the genome, and we are not restricted to the current library of restriction enzymes, and the 20 nucleotide targeting ensures even greater specificity. In the cells, the Cas9 protein requires the use of a CRISPR RNA and a tracer RNA for cleavage. Like I said, Cas9 doesn't function on its own like other nucleases. Cas9 works together with a set of RNAs to guide the complex to its target. In addition to the Cas9 nuclease, two small RNAs are needed. One is the CRISPR RNA, or CRRNA, and it contains the target sequence information that is complementary to the site that it to be cut. The second is the tracer RNA, or transactivating CRISPR RNA, which binds to the CRRNA and is also responsible for binding to the Cas9 protein. Another feature of this system is the protospacer adjacent motif, or the PAM site, seen here in red. A PAM site just downstream of your target is necessary for cleavage by Cas9. For S. pyogenes Cas9, the PAM sequence is NGG, and the cut occurs three bases upstream. This is where biotechnology wins. We can take advantage of this system and make our own program nucleases, and we can do this very rapidly, allowing researchers to come up with new experiments and within days have the tools ready. One of our goals at NEB was to simplify the workflows for these experiments and make them easier for everyone to use. In biotechnology, one of the tricks that has been used is to combine the CRRNA and tracer RNA into one single guide RNA, or as we refer to it, sgRNA. This was a really great advancement as it simplified the process as only one RNA is needed and there's no annealing necessary. It, it has become the more popular form of guide RNA to use for Cas9. We're going to discuss the different ways of making sgRNA later in this presentation. The red arrow in this figure shows where the CRISPR and tracer RNAs are fused to create an sgRNA. The beauty of this is that only one piece of RNA is needed for each gene editing experiment. So today, I'll discuss how NEB reagents and kits can be used in genome editing workflows. Genome editing, as we describe it here, is the use of the Cas9 and guide RNA, in this case, a single guide RNA, combining the CRISPR and tracer RNA that we just discussed to introduce a sequence-specific double-strand break. This can be used to knock out gene function through the error-prone non-homologous end-joining pathway or introduce exogenous DNA through the HDR cellular repair mechanism. While the approach you take varies depending on your experimental system and other considerations, all require the introduction of sgRNA and Cas9, as well as an optional HDR template. Current published methods range from introduction of plasmids containing Cas9 and gRNA coding sequences to mRNA-based approaches to direct introduction of proteins. 
Here are some applications of Cas9. In general, Cas9 is used to create double strand breaks that are left to the cell's DNA repair machinery. In the first picture, we are looking at wild type Cas9 and the two possible outcomes that can come from double strand break repair. In mammalian cells, non homologous end joining will directly ligate the broken ends of the double strand break. When no donor DNA is present, Repair by this error-prone pathway will occur, which may result in small insertions or deletions, which we refer to as indels. These indels can disrupt genes and therefore produce gene knockouts. Later in this presentation, we will discuss how to detect these indels. As an alternative repair pathway, homology-directed repair will allow for adding exogenous DNA by presenting a donor DNA from which the cell can repair via the homologous recombination pathway. In this application, precise modifications or additions can be made. In addition to wild type Cas9, biotechnology has created Cas9 variants with additional properties. In this second panel, you'll see the Cas9 nickase. Cas9 nickase has been engineered by a point mutation in the RUV-C domain, which enables it to cut only one strand of the double-stranded target. Nicking occurs opposite the target sequence. By using two different guide RNAs in combination, staggered DNA breaks can be generated with reduced off-target cleavage by targeting two sites in close proximity. In the third panel, you will see some uses for DCAS9, or nuclease deficient or dead Cas9. DCAS9 has both nuclease domains mutated such that it only retains RNA-guided DNA binding without cleavage. Once programmed, it will find and recognize its target site. This will allow for potentially tethering such things as activators or repressors to DCAS9 to localize them to certain sites in a genome. Additionally, they could be used for visual visualization by adding fluorescent molecules such as GFP. NAB has developed a novel DCAS9 that is a SNAP tag fusion. SNAP technology is unique to NAB, and the N terminal SNAP tag allows for covalent attachment of fluorophores, biotin, and a number of other conjugates useful for visualization and target enrichment. Both the NICase and DCAS9 contain nuclear localization signals. NEB has an existing portfolio of SNAP tools available, such as uh, magnetic beads for capture and SNAP biotin, which can be used with, in conjunction with uh, streptavidin beads for pull-down or enrichment. In addition to s pyogenes Cas9, there are many different Cas enzymes that have different properties. One that we have recently released is LBA Cas12A, also known as LBCPF1, which has a different PAM sequence requirement than by Cas9 that opens up more targeting opportunities in AT-rich genomes. Cas12A also differs from Cas9 in that it leaves a 5' overhang on the 5' side of the protospacer sequence. Cas12 also only requires a short CRISPR RNA and no tracer RNA is needed. LBA Cas12A also has different biophysical properties. Here we show that ASB Cas12A has the same PAM sequence requirement as LBA Cas12A but they differ in their temperature activity profiles. This can be useful when considering experimental systems or organisms that require different temperatures, such as zebrafish and xenopus. You can see here that LBA Cas12A works at temperatures below which ASB Cas12A has reduced or no activity. This was highlighted in the recent paper published in Nature Communications by Antonio Geraldez. So today, we'll discuss the genome editing workflow in more detail. The main question being, how do I do gene editing? We've divided this into four different parts. The first thing you would need to do is design your target. We will begin by going over some of the web resources that can be useful for target selection. Uh, then we will discuss the different methods of generating Cas9 nuclease and guide RNAs. Once the nuclease and SJR RNA are made, we need to get them into the cells. This is the next part of the workflow, and we will discuss some of the options for delivering these complexes. Finally, we will discuss the analysis of the gene editing experiments, that is, how to determine the efficiency of your gene editing experiments. We will go over mismatch detection assays, as well as target site destruction and sequence-based methods of analyzing editing outcomes. Uh, the first web resource we would like to point you towards would be our own website. This is where you'll find our ever-growing gene editing portfolio products, including our NGen branded products as well as lots of resources for gene editing experiments, including many that we will discuss today. In addition to protocols and application notes for using Cas9 in vitro and in vivo, you'll find many links to other web resources that we will mention on today's webinar. 
first point I want to make about nucleus designs is that the tools for design are rapidly evolving. They are mostly informatic tools that try to reduce potential off-target pairing. Some are used to target restriction enzyme sites, which we'll talk about later. And some are used to help design experiments for knocking in donor DNA. Below are some of the resources uh, found on the web that can be used for target finding, uh, including Chop Chop, uh, Benchling, Desktop Genetics, which all have uh, great interfaces for finding target sites. Uh, and then on to the right is a screenshot from Chop Chop showing what some of these outputs look like. If you go to a site like Chop Chop to search for targets, you're able to enter your gene of interest and specify the organism and the CRISPR protein you are using and ask it to find possible targets. Once you click on the Find Target Site, you will be presented with a number of potential targets. Here is a screen from Chop Chop that depicts the gene of interest complete with exons and introns, and marked by arrows are the potential Cas9 target sites. Below that will be displayed a list of potential Cas9 target sites which you can use to design your guide RNAs. We will come back to the screen later when we discuss how to create your guide RNAs. So the second step after designing your target sequence is generating the Cas9 nucleus with a guide RNA. There are a few ways this can be done. One is using a plasma that encodes an sgRNA, as well as one encoding a Cas9 protein. The second would be generating both as RNAs. This can be done by making both the single guide RNAs along with the Cas9 mRNA for delivery into cells. The third method would be to make sgRNA and combine with recombinant Cas9 protein. These are referred to as ribonucleoproteins, or RNPs. These can be used to deliver to cells and can also be used for in vitro digestions of DNA and are our preferred method, as you'll see. We wanted to highlight an experiment we did to show a comparison of the different delivery methods of Cas9 and guide RNA, the results of which show the different editing efficiencies that were the outcome of targeting the same locus with the different delivery methods. We compared the plasma-based expression of sgRNA and Cas9 with the mRNA and guide RNA combination, followed by the RNP methods. With the RNPs, we compared both with and without nuclear localization signals. Our engine Cas9 has one NLS on each terminus. You can see from these results that the RNPs outperform both of the other two methods, with the NLSs further increasing editing efficiencies. We wanted to highlight a great plasmid resource, adgene.org. They also have lots of educational material on gene editing and protocol, as well as being a nonprofit plasmid repository where you can obtain plasmids used for gene editing experiments. They are a great resource for plasmids for getting started with the plasmid-based methods of genome editing. We encourage you to check them out while designing your experiments. Now we're going to switch to making of sgRNA plasmids. We're going to talk about several different ways to generate sgRNA expressing plasmids. Many of these methods, methods can also be used to generate sgRNA transcription templates. The first method to mention is the BBS1 enzyme based strategy, which is fairly widely used, especially with adgene plasmids. It takes advantage of a feature of type 2S restriction, restriction enzymes, which is that they digest outside of their recognition sequence. This has a couple of advantages. The overhanging sequence is not dictated by the restriction enzyme recognition sequence, and there's no scar left from the digest. Since the site is eliminated in this strategy, digestion and ligation can both take place simultaneously. This allows you to cut out a fragment and precisely ligate in a new one in the correct orientation. The second method we are going to talk about is the method of using Q5 mutagenesis. This method was developed by the Dickinson Lab at UNC. With Q5 mutagenesis, you begin with an sgRNA expression vector that you already have or obtained from someplace like adgene. And by designing primers that contain a new target sequence, you can easily insert or replace an existing sgRNA target sequence. The Q5 polymerase is able to replicate the whole plasmid using two abutting primers. By adding in a 20 nucleotide sequence on the tail end of one of the primers, you are able to add this sequence to the new plasmid. The KLD mix contained in the kit contains a kinase to phosphorylate the ends of the PCR products and prepares them for ligation by the ligase. The DPN1 enzyme in the mix is specific for methylated DNA and therefore will digest away the parental vector but not touch the unmethylated assembled vectors. NEB has a very convenient web tool for designing the primers to make the changes that you want. The tool that we use is called the NEB, the NEBase changer. 
The NE Basin tool is available on the NEB website and is an easy way to design primers for doing Q5 mutagenesis. The output of the program contains the sequences for the primers to be ordered, as well as a protocol for the PCR reaction that gives you the proper TMs for those primers as well. The tool simplifies the mutagenesis design and provides the entire protocol. It's a very convenient and foolproof method. It's especially useful for replacing small sequences such as Cas9 target sequences. We have another method for exchanging sgRNA target sequences. This is with the AnyBuilder HiFi DNA assembly strategy. There is an application note available on the NEB website that goes into more detail on how to do this. In short, it's the simplest method to generate a new plasmid using only one single-stranded DNA oligo that contains short homology arms with the cut vector. The exonuclease in the mix recesses the ends of the cut vector revealing complementarity to the single-stranded DNA oligo. The polymerase can then fill in the gaps, and the ligase then seal the NICs. There's no PCR or annealing. It's that simple. Okay. okay, now we'll move on to Cas9 mRNA synthesis. To make Cas9 mRNA, there's really only one method, which would be in vitro transcription. For Cas9 mRNA, there are two ways to make it by in vitro transcription. One method is to perform standard in vitro transcription using T7 RNA polymerase followed by poly A tailing and enzymatic capping using vaccinia capping enzyme, which NAB carries. The other method is to perform co-transcriptional capping, which incorporates the cap analog ARCA in the nucleotide mix, which results in capped RNA being formed during the transcription reaction as the T7 polymerase will incorporate the cap analog only in the first position of the transcript. This can be made even simpler if the poly-A tail is encoded in the transcription template, allowing one to skip the tailing reaction. We have several kits available to simplify this part of the workflow. We have two kits for post-transcriptional capping, one in the master mix format called the HiScribe T7 Quick Kit, which we would recommend unless you want to be able to fully replace with modified nucleotides. Then you would use the HiScribe High Yield Kit, or the non-Quick Kit version. For co-transcriptional capping, we have two ARCA-containing kits, one with poly A tailing reagents and one without. Each of these methods has its advantages. Post-transcriptional capping with vaccinia capping and enzyme has the advantage of having close to 100% of transcripts being capped after the reaction. Co-transcriptional capping has a much quicker protocol with fewer steps. The workflows here are shown in orange, showing the steps for each. For standard transcription, the in vitro transcription can take as little as 30 to 60 minutes, followed by a short DNA treatment and then capping and tailing, which take about 30 minutes each. Purification is then followed by yield and quality analysis. For co-transcriptional capping, the transcription reaction is again 30 to 60 minutes, followed by DNA treatment. Poly A tailing, if necessary, and no capping step, and then purification. Now we're going to move on to generating sgRNAs. In addition to using plasmids for sgRNA introduction, we want to highlight the use of pre-made sgRNA that can be complex with Cas9 to make RNPs. The method that will result in the highest editing efficiency. There are two main sources of sgRNA, chemically synthesized RNA oligos and in vitro transcribed sgRNAs. Chemically synthesized RNA oligos can be quite costly and can take extra time for delivery. Thus, we have created a simplified method for creating sgRNAs Making sgRNAs does not need to be difficult. As, as we discussed earlier, there are a couple of methods that use in vitro transcribed RNA. Those would be used in conjunction with Cas9 mRNA or Cas9 protein. In the next few slides, we will discuss the various ways we have available to transcribe sgRNA and how we have worked to simplify this process as well. For in vitro transcription of sgRNA, a DNA template needs to be made. The template needed to make sgRNA needs to have a T7 promoter sequence at the 5' prime end, followed by the 20 nucleotide target sequence, and then the s pyogenase specific tracer sequence. Using this double-stranded DNA template in one of our transcription kits, an RNA transcript can be produced, which contains the top strand sequence minus the T7 promoter sequence. The minimum size for the DNA template would therefore be around 120 base pairs to make a 100 nucleotide sgRNA. 
The source of the template could be from a linearized plasmid, from a PCR product, or from a synthetic DNA source such as a G-block or gene stream. There are a couple of options for making sgRNA transcripts, including a novel kit we developed specifically for sgRNA synthesis. Uh, which to use depends mostly on the source of your template. If you already have a template from one of the sources we just mentioned, being a plasmid, PCR product, or G-block, then one of our standard in vitro transcription kits can be used. We would recommend the HiScribe T7 Quick Kit here as well, as it is a master mix formulation and is therefore simpler to use and has less steps. For those who don't currently have a template ready to go and want to avoid the steps necessary to create one, we have developed a kit that just requires you to obtain one single-stranded DNA oligo of around 55 nucleotides per target. This method is also preferable if you need to make many different sgRNAs when those cloning steps really start to add up. This kit is called the NGen sgRNA synthesis kit and is specific to the s pyogenes Cas9. So let's write that the alternative method to introducing single-guide RNAs on plasmas is direct introduction of single-guide RNA with mRNA or Cas9 protein. Traditionally, this would be done by generation of a DNA template for in vitro transcription of RNA that we just went over. While we support this method with our Hiscribe kits I just told you about, we now have an even easier solution, the sgRNA synthesis kit, for which we coined the term single guide simplified. The NGen sgRNA synthesis kit works by supplying a user designed 55 nucleotide single stranded DNA oligo, which contains your target sequence, to a one tube reaction. After 30 minutes of incubation, 15 minutes of DNA one treatment and cleanup, you have a single guide RNA. The beauty of this method is how simple it is. It requires no cloning, no G blocks, or PCR or buying expensive RNA oligos. It allows for rapid optimization of sgRNA sequences by allowing you to easily synthesize different sgRNAs simply by ordering more inexpensive DNA oligos, which have a shorter lead time. It also allows for the synthesis of arrayed or pooled libraries of guide RNAs. How it works. That target-specific oligo I mentioned only requires you to specify the important part, the 20 nucleotide target sequence. We'll take care of designing the rest of the oligo, making sure it has a T7 promoter and then a specific overlap sequence that will be used in the kit. That overlap sequence anneals to a scaffold oligo that is contained in the reaction mix. Did I mention that there are only two reagents to add to your oligo? Pretty simple. The scaffold oligo in the kit contains the tracer part that is specific to S. pyogenes. That's the larger oligo, and it's universal to S. pyogenes Cas9, so we want to make it as easy as possible and included it in the mix. The cool part about this is that what happens in the tube all at the same time. After you add the reagents together with your oligo, there is a DNA polymerase in the tube that will extend the two primers and create a double-stranded DNA template for RNA transcription. In the same tube, at the same time, T7 RNA polymerase will find those newly made double-stranded templates and start transcribing RNA. We've coupled template assembly and transcription in one quick and easy reaction, and the RNA looks great. The end product of the sgRNA synthesis kit is microgram quantities of sgRNA. We wanted to show you how clean these look, so here we have a gel of four different sgRNAs, including the control that is provided in the kit. We spent a lot of time designing the kit to make it as robust as possible. We have tested hundreds of sgRNAs, and although they do vary in yield, most fall within the 15 to 25 microgram range. Even the most difficult sgRNAs we could design still produced 4 to 5 micrograms of RNA at a minimum, and some went as high as 50 micrograms. We have designed a web tool to make designing the oligos painless. I'll show you how that works now. Remember back to when we looked at the chop chop uh, site in the beginning of the talk? Now we can take that outputted target sequence, uh, highlighted in red, and copy it in, to use with the NEV web tool. This would be the same regardless of which web resource you use to generate your targets. The important thing is to copy the 20 nucleotide sequence and remember not to include the PAM sequence. This is a common mistake. Some programs show it with the PAM sequence and some without. It is correct to say that the PAM is part of the recognition sequence in the genome. However, it is not part of the sgRNA. Don't worry. Our web tool makes sure the PAM is not included. The NEB website, in the interactive tools section, you will find the NE Biocalculator. 
Once you click on this, it will take you to the calculator where you can then select the SGRNA Designer tab on the left-hand column. The window labeled Target DNA Sequence, where you can paste your 20 nucleotide sequence or enter using the keyboard if you like. The tool will track how many nucleotides you enter. It has several fail-safes built in. I told you not to enter the PAM, but we'll still keep an eye out for it. We won't force you to remove it, but we will warn you if we think you've added it by mistake. It also won't let you enter non-nucleotide sequences. One important feature of T7 RNA transcription is that there needs to be at least one G residue at the 5' end of the template, immediately following the T7 promoter. If your sequence doesn't have one, the oligo designer will add one for you. So, as you can see here, we pasted the sequence from ChopChop. The counter shows 20 nucleotides. It has also let us know that there wasn't a G in our sequence and that it added one to the 5' prime end of our target sequence. This is not a problem for Cas9 targeting cleavage. We will not let you output an oligo without a G because we know it won't work and we don't want your transcription to fail. What you will see in the top portion of box 2 is the sequence of the oligo that you are going to order. The sequence underneath that is the resulting sgRNA transcript when the oligo is used with our sgRNA kit. That additional sequence you see comes from the scaffold oligo we talked about earlier. Now you can click on Add Results, and this oligo will be added to the list at the bottom of your screen in an empty top box so you can enter another sequence. If you click the button you see at the bottom of the screen, you will start to collect oligo sequences that you can then select and copy to your favorite oligo supplier where you can then place your order for oligos. You can continue to add sequences and build the list of oligos. When you're finished designing the oligos, you can click on the printable results tab, which will bring you to the next window. Here we have designed a printable window so that you will then be able to have a record of the oligos you ordered, as well as the exact sequences of the sgRNAs that will be produced with your kit. If you still use a paper notebook like me, you can then paste it in your notebook for safekeeping. So that's it for the Oligo Designer. We made it as simple as possible. Uh, here is some data comparing chemically synthesized CRISPR tracer RNAs and sgRNAs to RNAs that are transcribed using the sgRNA kit with and without SIP treatment. These were RNP electroporations using the Lanza Nucleofactor kit. We used the epicenter quick extract solution to extract the genomic DNA from the cells 48 hours post transfection we chose several targets in 293 cells and measured the percent modification using our NGEN mutation detection kit, which is a T7 endonuclease-based assay. We see just as efficient editing with the in vitro transcribed RNA as with the chemically synthesized RNAs across all targets tested here. Earlier, one of the methods that CRISPR gene editing is used for is introducing new DNA. This is done by employing the homologous repair pathway to do this, donor DNA is presented to the cells in conjunction with the double-strand breaks. When the DNA that contains homologous regions is available, the cells can bypass the error-prone repair pathway in favor of homology-directed repair. In addition to sgRNA and Cas9 options that we have been discussing, there is now another option, which is to also introduce a homologous repair template in the form of DNA. Very briefly, I'll mention some of the methods for creating these templates. These will sound very familiar. And the first panel is essentially a traditional cloning workflow involving ligation of a PCR product into a restriction enzyme linearized vector. On the right side, you will see two alternate methods, which we've already discussed for other plasmid construction, NED Builder Hi-Fi, as well as the Q5 site-directed mutagenesis methods. Once again, AbGene is a very good resource for homology-directed repair guides. Most commonly, plasmids are used for HDR templates, but increasingly, single-stranded DNA is being used at high efficiency, especially for small insertions. These can be oligo-based for insertions less than 50 nucleotides. Information on these protocols is available on the AbGene site. Once all the pieces have been made, they need to be delivered to the cells. There are several ways to do this, be it by microinjection, transfection by lipofection, or electroporation. Our preferred method is to use RMPs, as they will result in the highest doses and the shortest, most controlled duration. Plasmids can survive for longer, so the dose of Cas9 can be quite unpredictable. So in short, high dose, short duration for best results. Protocol development in the field is developing rapidly. 
we'd like to guide you towards the rest of the genome engineering field for the most up-to-date protocols, including organism-specific resources. One highly trafficked resource is the CRISPR Google group, where there is a lot of active discussion of gene editing protocols. We have some protocols on our website to get you started, but if you have more complex or specific questions, these would be good places to look for help. Here is a sample of some of the protocols we have available on our website. These are meant to give you a starting point in which to design your experiments. If you are using different cell types, these can be used as guides to give you an idea on how to plan your experiments, how many cells to use, how much protein to start with, etc. Another resource for introducing Cas9 into cells is the Miris website. They have protocols available on their site for transfection and light preparation using Cas9 RMPs. They are a good resource for both delivery methods and reagents for transfection and electroporation for many different cell types. So you've made the sgRNA and complex your RMPs and delivered them to cells. Now we're going to move on to determining how your experiment actually worked, or how to measure editing efficiency. We will start with the most widely used mismatch detection-based assays, including the T7 and the nucleus 1 in our mutation detection kit. Then we'll discuss target site destruction and sequencing-based methods. The most used methods to detect editing efficiency have been based on mismatch detection enzymes such as Surveyor, the cell 1 nuclease, and the T7 endonuclease 1, the heteroduplex resolving enzyme. Both are applicable to this workflow I'm showing you. We begin by isolating genomic DNA from our experiments. That is followed by PCR to amplify a region surrounding the target locus. We recommend an amplicon of approximately 500,000 base pairs for the PCR reaction. It is important to design the amplicons such that the cut site is off-center, allowing for discernible bands on a gel or fragment analyzer. The PCR reaction is subjected to denaturation and reannealing, which will result in three possible products. One will be the homoduplex wild type, Two will be the homoduplex mutant, and the third will be the heteroduplex. This pool of duplexes is then subjected to the enzyme of choice, in this instance, T7 and the nucleus 1. The T7 enzyme will digest only those that are heteroduplexes. The resulting digest is either run on a gel or on a fragment analyzer. When run on a gel, these smaller fragments represent on-target edits. By following a simple calculation provided on our website, one can then estimate the efficiency of the editing experiment to get an idea of what percentage of the cells were modified. Another method for calculating editing efficiency is by doing tide analysis, which stands for tracking of indels by decomposition. This is essentially sequencing of the pool of DNAs and computational analysis to get a distribution of the mutations not only gives you editing efficiency, but also a picture of the size distribution of these edits, or indels. We would recommend using a high-fidelity polymerase such as Q5, which is also robust and is able to sequence through a wide variety of GC contents. In, in addition to standalone T7 and the nucleus 1, for which we have protocols available, we also have developed a kit that simplifies the mutation detection process. The NGEM Mutation Detection Kit is a T7 endonuclease-based assay kit. It combines a Q5 polymerase master mix and T7 enzyme and a control mix for simplification. The advantages of this kit are that it was developed using a master mix formula of Q5, simplifying the PCR setup. The Q5 polymerase is also much faster than other polymerases, reducing the total reaction time significantly. We formulated the kit such that no cleanup of the PCR reaction is necessary before proceeding with that digestion with the T7 and the nuclease. This formulation also takes away the concern about buffer compatibility for the T7 enzyme. There is no need to use additional additives or nuclease. Analysis can then be done by gel or fragment analyzer. Another important feature of this kit is the included positive control mix. The control mix is a mixture of two PUC19 plasmids that vary in size by 10 base pair insertion. When amplified together using the same primer set and subjected to denature and annealing conditions, they will form heteroduplexes. So this control will show you that your PCR regions are working and also show you that your T7 and the nuclease is working. It's a nice peace of mind to have when doing gene editing experiments. An alternate method of analysis of on-target editing is target site destruction. This takes advantage of either restriction enzyme sites or uncut Cas9 sites. 
There is no denature in the needle step after PCR. You go directly to digestion with either restriction enzyme or Cas9 using the targeting guide you already have. The digested fraction here represents the unmodified DNA, while uncut now represents the mutated fraction. One of the benefits of this method is that you would already have the Cas9 sgRNA complex used for your experiments on hand and would now be using it in vitro. Another more precise method would be amplicon sequencing using high fidelity polymerases and next generation sequencing, such as using our Q5 polymerases. This is more costly and time consuming, but can give you precise analysis of edits. Q5 polymerase has a more uniform amplification across a wider range of base compositions and the lowest error rate of any commercially available DNA polymerase. Briefly, off-target detection is still difficult and expensive. There are two methods that are currently seen to be preferred, those being CircleSeq and SiteSeq. CircleSeq involves circularizing fragmented DNA, removing linear fragments, then digesting the remaining circles with Cas9 and ligating adapters to the Cas9 cut sites for sequencing. SiteSeq involves digesting genomic DNA with Cas9 and uses selective enrichment to identify Cas9 cleavage sites in purified genomic DNA. Recommend Q5 polymerase for amplicon sequencing. Q5 polymerase fidelity is 280 times the fidelity of TAC and about six times higher than fusion polymerase. Some of our NEB scientists have recently published a paper discussing the fidelity of Q5. It is listed here on this figure below, entitled Examining Sources of Error in PCR by Single Molecule Sequencing. Here is also a figure that shows the robustness of the Q5 polymerase, that is, how well it performs for different GC content compared to other polymerases. In this figure, the color of the circles indicates the purity of the PCR band, dark green being the best and red being the worst. The size of the dot represents the yield, so larger green dots are better than smaller red dots. You can see from this figure that Q5 is better across a wider variety of GC contents, outperforming every other polymerase tested, and especially important in the high GC range. So uh, we wanted to leave you with some links to some of the resources we mentioned in the presentation. Uh, many of these can also be accessed from our website. Uh, so we will now try to take some of your questions that you have about the presentation, uh, we probably won't be able to cover all of them in the time remaining, uh, so we will try to get back to most of you by email if possible. Thanks for listening. Good afternoon, everyone. We now have some time for some questions for our team here. I'll pass it over to Ezra. Okay, so we got a we got a few questions. Um, we'll start out. Um, we asked uh, the best way to test uh, editing plasmids in tissue culture before introduction into mice. Uh, I'm assuming we're talking about a plasmid expressing Cas9 and guide RNA, in which case um, you probably want to make sure to test a few different uh, guide RNAs, um, and then analyze editing by uh, isolating the genomic DNA and doing a T7 N01. Uh, digest, and you can use something like our mutation detection kit uh, for doing that. Um, so we are also asked about, uh, can you mix two different sgRNA templates into a single NGEN sgRNA synthesis reaction? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, I think we've done up to around six of them, uh, and they were all uh, made and they all worked. Uh, you just, the only thing is you can't predict exactly uh, how much yield you'll get of each individual guide. Um, also asked, is it okay to add a G on the five prime end of the target sequence in our oligo designer for the sgRNA synthesis kit? Um, and first of all, I just want to say that it's not hard to find targets with G in the sequence, so it's usually uh, easy to find one. But for those without, the literature says that it doesn't make uh, much of a difference. It also says that the pan proximal part of the target is most susceptible to mismatches, and so the five prime end should be okay. Um, let's see. Uh, so uh, also asked about observation um, that some guide RNAs have trouble cutting 
in vitro, and if we have any suggestions for improving in vitro Cas9 digestion. Um, uh, first of all, not all sgRNAs work the same, uh, and we've actually observed for a lot of guides that any BD buffer 3.1 happens to work better than the uh, Cas9 10x buffer that we had been including with the enzyme. And so we started to ship new Cas9 proteins uh, with buffer 3.1, and uh, sometime soon the current product should be switched over to buffer 3.1. Um, we'd also recommend adjusting the ratio of RMP to target and increasing the ratio of the Cas9 to the sgRNA to the target up to 20 to 20 to 1 or even 40 to 20 to 1 uh, may sometimes improve digestion. And also, it's important to note that some sgRNAs inherently just don't work well, and that's why people often design multiple targets. Um, Oh, are there five prime phosphates from in vitro transcription a problem? Um, so it's well known that some cell types are sensitive to five prime uh, phosphates. Um, we haven't tested all cell types, but we have not seen a difference in the ones that we have tested, which is why we list this as an optional step in the sgRNA synthesis. Um, this is something you would have to determine for your cell type. And it's also worth noting that the sgRNA synthesis kit will result in the same five prime ends as any other type of RNA transcription, uh, be it by one of our kits or by using any other T7 polymerase-based uh, kit. Um, however, if you do want to remove those, you can simply use SIP to remove the phosphates. And you can contact us for the pro protocol, uh, and we're working on putting that up on the website. Um, hold on. Um, let's see here, just looking through the questions. They all seem to come in at the end, so I'll give us a second here. Um, and so, uh, is it why is there only one G in the transcription template? Um, they thought that they needed two or three. Um, so we found that with shorter RNAs, we have seen that 1G is sufficient, and we've tested this with multiple guides and found no difference in yield between 1 and 3 Gs. And so we've been asked the best method for screening for CRISPR-edited gene products, and I mean, we would recommend starting with the T7 endo one uh, based assay to look to look for uh, editing efficiency to give you a good uh, idea how well it's working. Um, and someone asked if there's plan to make a kit similar to the uh, NGen sgRNA synthesis kit, but with an option to supply their own scaffold oligo um, so that it could be used with other than s pyogenes Cas9. Um, we don't often um, talk about development plans. Um, we don't have one of those available now, um, since not all guide RNAs are um, made the same way or the same size. Um, but we could may maybe talk offline some more about that question. Uh, so someone was concerned with off-targeting. And um, so one of the things that, that people have used to deal with off-target effects are by using the Cas9 nickase, um, which will reduce the possibility of creating uh, accidental double-strand breaks. Oh, and uh, another question about uh, what if our T7 endo does not work? Um, so there's other methods like uh, amplicon sequencing that you could use. If it's a specific question about the T7 enzyme, um, we have troubleshooting um, FAQs on the website, um, and we provide, with our mutation detection kit, we provide a control uh, so that you can test to see if the T7 enzyme has worked. Uh, another one is, what other organisms can the gene editing system apply to? Um, uh, the, there's a lot of them. Uh, mice, mm -hmm. zebrafish, um, you know, all kinds of different cell types. Um,
Uh, I think, yeah, there's, we can, um, I guess, get to the rest of these questions uh, via email if we haven't answered them. Um, so thanks for tuning in. If you have other questions, you can continue to um, send them in. You can email at info at NEB.com. Um, and you can also call us and ask for the uh, gene editing team and get us on uh, technical support, and we'd be happy to um, get those. And we'll answer any other questions on here uh, by email. Thanks so much for joining today, everyone.